Bona locale, my garden of roses. I think we need to spend some time talking about the Los Angeles homeless and Los Angeles' plan to set up trailer parks to house the homeless. Now, Los Angeles is probably one of the few places with a large homeless population I haven't been to personally. However, I've been following this story pretty closely for the last few months because Los Angeles has had a sharp increase of nearly 30% from 20,000 to 35,000 homeless individuals living in the metro area. And this has caused some severe problems. They try to force as many as the homeless people into specific areas such as Olvera and Northern Orange County and other places like this. But the population is getting so large and the ability to house them either in homeless shelters or in um, temporary facilities or even tent cities has become nearly impossible for them. And part of that problem is the fact that doing so actually creates more problems than it solves. And here's why. Now, first and foremost, a major percentage a nearly 85% of the homeless population in the United States is male. And in order to help male homeless people, you can't just give them a house. For the most part, they don't just want a house unless they are severely addicted to drugs, which most of them end up only addicted after they end up homeless. While they may dabble in drugs before that, the reasons for becoming homeless often include losing their jobs, losing their wives, basically seeing a rapid downward spiral in their life that leads them to drug abuse, that leads them to a position where they feel completely alienated and necessitating them to lash out and attack people. It's, it's, horribly depressing. This is something I've seen from New York to Pittsburgh to Miami to uh, Seattle all over. And the one thing that I know helps them the most seems to be the one thing that no major city wishes to even attempt, and that's large-scale work programs. Of course, Los Angeles has no interest in attempting large-scale work programs, whether they be infrastructure projects, cleaning projects, or anything of the sort, most of what they're interested in doing is getting these tent cities and these tent alleys out of the public view and forcing these homeless people into a place out of sight and out of mind. This is only going to blow up in their faces. I've personally lived in some of the tent cities and uh, homeless enclaves, especially in Seattle, and this, these environments are extremely toxic. Primarily, you end up with a drug of choice, which someone who is able to sell to these homeless people, either by manipulating them into signing over their social security checks and food stamps and cash assistance, or just outright having them pay all of their money in another way every fucking month for, the, for access to these drugs. This ends up, I mean, for example, there's a, a spot in Seattle known as the Jungle. It is the, at the intersection of the 99 and 101 Highway, 101? No, the 99 and the 5 Highway, excuse me, where a large amount of grassy and ivy overgrowth has created a very difficult to get into jungle of sorts, as it's described, with enough room for about, it, it's, about five feet tall in the highest spot, so you have to squat down in the covered areas just to navigate around. There's enough room for about 10 medium to large sized tents, and in this area, if you're not a heroin addict or a speedball addict, you are not going to be welcome because they don't trust normies as you might describe them. They don't trust anyone who isn't as severely addicted and dependent on these drugs as they are. They will force you out. They will even fight you. It took me quite a lot just to get into this community when I needed to stay dry and I wasn't even able to stay there for a long time. Now there's also another spot which is primarily controlled by Native Americans in the uh, Seattle area near what's called Native Park 
Uh, it's a park which was dedicated by an anthropologist who opened a museum nearby, but uh, it, it essentially serves as the homeless place where local Native Americans get together and often sell both weed and methamphetamines. Uh, the addicts then will take their drugs and go down the street, past a coffee shop, and under a bridge. And it took a lot of effort for me to carve out a spot under this bridge for myself because it was a lot less populated than the jungle. It was a lot less populated than the park across the street from the main homeless shelter in Seattle. And it gave me a place to be. However, I didn't want to be around these severe drug addicts. Or if they were going to be doing it, I wanted them to have some goddamn respect, not shitting on the sidewalk and in the dirt path next to the sidewalk. These are the kinds of environments that are going to be created by creating these trailer park cities. Because there's no interest in helping the genuinely helping these mostly homeless men with a very, very small, maybe 1 in 10, 1 in 15 women. Uh, there's no intention on, you know, actually providing them work uh, programs, uh, mental health services. They're just going to be there in order to get them out of the way. There's no contingencies or, or account by which these people are going to be held in order to live in the place. These are just the people that they consider most chronically homeless and most in need of being gotten out of the way. Notably, they're only putting up 67 trailers. 67 trailers can house at most about 110 homeless people. And even with those housed, that doesn't solve the problem of nearly over 35,000 other homeless people in the area needing to be housed, needing to be assisted. Now, the reason that I harp on homeless work programs so much isn't because I look at these people and think, oh, get a job, because that's not what I think. I don't think some of them can get jobs, and I feel absolutely horrible for them. However, I do think they need a way to work with their hands to feel like what they do has meaning. I have a, a story, I've told it a couple times, although I don't think I have a video up right now in which I've told it. And in this story, I, this is from when I was living in the homeless housing and facility uh, that I was at shortly before uh, ending up, uh, before I moved to Florida. Uh, in this place, there was a guy, I won't say his name, but there was a guy who had a pretty severe case of schizophrenia. I deeply apologize for the background noise, by the way. I, I, it's really hot in here, the air conditioner's not working, and I need some cool air. But uh, there was this guy, he had pretty severe schizophrenia. His family had basically abandoned him at 18 and sent him to the streets. And the social workers were able to get him a place to live in this in this housing facility, Evans House. If you want to look it up, it's uh, there's information about it online. I lived there for nearly a year and a half while I was going through chemotherapy and a number of other things while homeless. And this guy, he was he was very unique to me because you know when he was doing meth, and of course a lot of people in this building did meth, he was doing a lot worse. The uh, social workers had no idea what to do with him, and most of them acted out of terror, as if his schizophrenia somehow negatively affected them. And I understand certain amounts of uh, empathy leading to worry and fear about schizophrenics, but there was something about him. He, he, he was afraid of my dog, for one, and for those of you who know my dog, my dog's generally harmless. She's just you know, big, and for people who are intimidated by dogs, she can be absolutely intimidating. But he liked me. He liked sitting with me, and I'm not sure he even realized I was a real person. Sometimes I think he thought I was a figment of his imagination, because he didn't talk to people much at all. But it came to a point where I realized that he had no value in his life. He thought that nothing he did mattered. This came from conversation after conversation, and I fought with his social worker. There were only two social workers at the building. I fought with his social worker 
to try and get him a volunteer job because the DESC, the homeless uh, group out in Seattle, the group that runs most of the homeless facilities in Seattle, have a lot of like side businesses like thrift stores and the like. And I, I basically demanded they find him a, a, a work program, basically, a volunteer job, anything of the sort to get him out of the building and doing something separate from himself. And this created, like, the first week was really rough on him. He had to take a lot of breaks. He really felt like he was fucking up a lot, but he was talking with his social workers more and talking to the voices in his head a lot less. And after that first week, he started getting into the rhythm of going to this job and working with people and talking and helping people. And it made such an enormous difference in his life. And this is why I think Los Angeles is, I mean, it's one, it's a pittance to put up 67 trailers in the Olvera, dist you know, Olvera area when the problem exists for nearly 35,000 people. And it's also a pittance for these people who need more than just a place to live. While housing the homeless can have positive benefits, those positive benefits are at best short term. They need more. They need something to give their lives value, even if it's as meaningless as a shitty job or volunteer job at a uh, thrift store or something of the like. Or if it's just cleaning up the area, getting paid to clean up the area in which they live. But that's about all I have to say on that. If you've got some comments, feel free to leave them below and I will address them in my Saturday show. But until then, I will see you next time. Bonsoir.